This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. Okay, everybody, it's damn near tax day, and we're going to do, there's, there's two things that are going to happen on this episode. We're going to get into two things you never want to bring up to anybody. We're going to talk about finances, and we're going to talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to start with, we're going to talk about politics, kind of. Politics and the intersection of politics and conservation with Becky Humphreys, um, who's been on the show a couple times before. And we're going we're gonna to dig in with her. She's here in the studio. But joining us from not in the studio is Susie Orman, and she just was saying that we need to change, start a podcast called Money Eater. Um, and we wanted to catch up with her for a couple of reasons. One, because it's tax day, and we want to get some financial advice. And two, because there's some things I became aware of. Um, now, if, if you're wondering, or if you, you know, you've been out of touch, or you're, you're a little youngster, uh, Susie Orman is an, an American financial advisor, author of how many books? A lot of books. Ten. Ten? Ten, number one, New York Times bestseller. And I am just it. not a financial advisor, sir. I am <laughs> a financial icon of America. And you youngins, <laughs> if you don't know about me, that's why you're financially screwed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, yeah, if you don't have a big old boat, if you don't have a big old boat yet, it's because you haven't been listening to Susie. So <laughs> in 1987, she founded the Susie Orman Financial Group and her work as a financial advisor gained notability notoriety with the Susie Orman show which ran on CNBC and uh from for 13 years and does uh, a podcast I, I, I'll tell you my brief history which is two-time Emmy award winner twice named by Hunt, uh, Time magazine as the 100 most influential person in the world recently just named as one of the 50 over 50 women who have changed this world and I could go on and on but who cares you about that you are not Let's over mom. 50 <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it's true I actually said what well, took you so long because I'm about to be 73 are you really so, what yeah look it up you google it while you're sitting there <laughs> Corinne this is part of your research <laughs> well, well no I might have known I might have yeah. read that and thought that's impossible because she looks too great, but uh, that's what happens when you have a lot of money. <laughs> I haven't had any work done, but that's besides the point as well. Now, uh, okay, you you might be wondering, like, well, how, well, why this show? Because I found uh, now I've known once upon a time, uh, Susie and I for for a brief period overlap with our book publishers, but uh, she's a the reason she's on the show right now is she's a mega fisherman like wow. i got photos here of uh her with a stack of wahoo manages to live in bahamas which i need to ask how that goes down and when i first reached out to her about coming on the show i see a picture of her where she's standing next to a um an electric reel like a deep drop reel now normally if you meet like a you know when you're talking to a famous person and they fish and you get their fishing picture you're going to get a picture of them Holding a fly rod with a rainbow trout in Big Sky, Montana, with a with a guide <laughs> holding the net, or it's a marlin. Yeah, yeah right? but then I was like, hold on, a minute. she's standing with a deep drop <laughs> rig, and then I was like, this is a legit fisher person. Have you always fished? No. So when <laughs> I was sixty five, many years ago now, uh -huh. I had decided what would Susie Orman be if. She didn't have the number one show on CNBC for 13 years or how many ever years it was. If she didn't have, you know, standing ovations of 50,000 people at a time, if she didn't have this, that, 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 what would I be if all of that went away? So one day I decided to sell five homes, quit my show, stop writing for Oprah, stop being on TV, bam, and we got a boat. And then we started to go all around on the boat. And our captain of the boat, because the insurance company made sure that I had a captain. They wouldn't let me captain it myself, which I could have, which 
did not go well with me, but I didn't have a choice, was an <laughs> avid fisherman. Okay. And so he would sit on the dock with us and we'd have these little fishes and that's all he thought these two women could do. So finally we fired him. We got him out of there, right? I started <laughs> to take over everything myself. And little by little, we had moved to the Bahamas, this little tiny island where we would watch everybody bring in these big fish. We didn't know what they were because we, we, we wanted to also fillet our fish ourselves. We were like, we are not going to be women who the help does this, the help does that. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to fish. We're going to captain our boat. We're going to clean our boat and we're going to, you know, clean our fish. And little by little, I, we would be asking questions. Like, how do you catch a wahoo? What's a wahoo? And before you know it, we, we got the equipment and we went out and we would try. And before you know it, we started to catch. And at first, we didn't know the difference between a barracuda and a wahoo. So we'd have to bring the fish in and ask somebody on the island, is this a barracuda or is this a wahoo? <laughs> and awesome. little by little, we got it down really well. And it was, I think it was just a few years ago, maybe 2018, whatever it was. But a few years ago, there was a Wahoo contest on the island. And there were nine boats that went out. Huge fishing vessels with captains and all these lines. And we had our little, you know, 32 foot Boston whaler with just two poles. That was it, the two LPs. And we won not only the contest, but we won the largest fish as well. Oh, I love that. <laughs> right. I love it. And now all the men were and who have been wahooing and everything for 30 years, we became their target as if they wanted to catch us. They never <laughs> quite have, but we've now well, I'm no longer known as the money lady, which was my nickname. We're now known on the island, KT and myself, as the fishing girls. Right. And when we go out you see the boats start to follow us because they want to know where are we going, what are we doing, and things like that. You're like that. the birds. And yeah, right? They're watching for us. Mm -hmm. Or we'll be somewhere and they'll come up just to kind of say hi, and I know they're marking my spot. <laughs> you know? So I'm always like, really? You have to pretend? You want my numbers? You can have it. You're still not going to catch here. I love but, it. Um, I love it. Right? Right, but anyway, and that's how it started, little by little. Now, I have a massive lure collection, a massive rod and reel collection, um, and we use them all the time. And how the are your fillet in, skills? Are you, are you good at cleaning fish? Yeah. It's actually KT that cleans them, right, because that's what she wanted to do. I didn't care one way or the other, to tell you the truth. <laughs> she is magnificent at it. Cool. She does like clean. You hold up the thing and you could see through it. She's fabulous at it. Right. Oh, and she's, love it. she's, and then we cry back it. And then we also share it with all the other people on the island, the islanders that work there. Oh, excellent. Now I got a question for you. Um, you mentioned getting up to a position where you, you, you got a nice boat. Now, one of our colleagues, Chester, um, <laughs> we used to call him Chester, the investor, his plan to get a walleye boat was uh, to throw in on Bitcoin. Yeah, good. I hope he did. Well, he did, and he got out. Uh, what got out a couple years ago. Him, right? <laughs> What's well, your... him, there's still time for him to get in a little bit now, because on April 20th, there will be a halving of Bitcoin. So we should see it, if the technicals stay the same, for Bitcoin to probably go up into the 80,000 or so area. Obviously, it's in the 70000 area now. It might be a little bit expensive to get in for a lot, but he can always buy the ETF IBIT, I-B-I-T, and make some money, not what he would have made if he had gone in when it was at its low not that long ago at $20,000 a Bitcoin. Well, Actually, let's make sure he tunes 000. in. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, what, what, what's your take if someone, um, how do you advise someone like Corinne had found a segment where a guy was trying to figure out if he could justify the purchase of a $20,000 fishing boat. When it comes to fishing boats, how do you, how do you instruct people to think about what's too much? Yeah. He should go on my, can I afford it segment on the women and money podcast? Cause at oh, the end okay. of every podcast we have that and I'll tell him 
First of all, there is nothing that is more expensive, and I don't care what size it is, than a boat. Your engines are either breaking. Everything on a boat today has a three-year lifespan. That is it. Your batteries will go. Your, your switches will go. Your everything will go. And so it's, it's hard to look at a boat with something not breaking on it as you're looking at it. Yeah. So it's not, can you afford to buy a boat? Can mm. you afford the upkeep on the boat? Can you afford the insurance on the boat? Can you afford the gasoline on the boat to really do things? Because gasoline now is far more expensive than it was years ago. So you, where are you going to house the boat? Are you living like in Florida or someplace that a hurricane could get the boat? So there's all these things that go into it. However, bottom line, you better have at least an eight to 12 month emergency fund of what it would cost you to live and pay your must pay expenses, your mortgage or your rent, your insurance, whatever it is, so that if you got sick, you were in an accident, you got laid off, you would be able to pay those for eight months. You better not have any credit card debt whatsoever. You better be fully funding your retirement accounts to the max. You better re be really so good when it comes to money. And then if you have that, you already bought a home, whatever it is, all right, you can have a boat. Good luck. Man, I don't know if... <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of boat owners. That's that not have. what we want to hear, Susie. <laughs> right. they I may thought not you'd say, listen, it. it's always a good idea to roll the dice on a big boat. <laughs> no. <laughs> because In you fact, never know. Here's what's funny, you guys. We've had a 32-foot boat now mm -hmm. for since 2016. Right? We are going on eight years with the same boat. The men on the island, and of course they would, they think bigger is better, all right? So they have to go from two engines to three engines to four engines. They have to go from a 300 to a 450 to a 600. They're nuts. If one of them gets a bigger boat, the others all get a bigger <laughs> boat. I have never seen anything like it. And then they say to me, why do you keep the same boat? <laughs> Why? What is wrong with you? One reason I keep the same boat is one of the reasons that I think that we are so successful in fishing, especially catching wahoo, is the wahoo, in my opinion, like the wash off the engines of our boat. Love it. Our mm. engines. And, and you get so, to stay out of what we call a boat measuring contest. <laughs> right. But... You know, I also just love beating them in a smaller boat anyway. So what's the difference? <laughs> well, that, that brings up a great point, though. Like when you go to invest in something recreationally, do you measure in the, the mental benefit of being able to go do something you love? Is that a factor? Yes and no. It depends. Like obviously for somebody like me, I'm a seriously wealthy woman. And if I wasn't, I shouldn't be who I am to this day. So I don't measure bigger necessarily being what can I cannot do. I like to buy exactly what I need, not what I can afford. Because I can afford more than what I need. I don't need more than a 32-foot boat. I don't. You know, it's just me and Kate. It's what I need it for. So just because I can afford it doesn't mean that I want to buy it. You used to be down. You used to advise people that, that uh, eating dinner out was a real financial drain. Such a drain. It was actually in 2009, I came out with a book called The 2009 Action Plan because the economy was a mess. I was on the Oprah Winfrey show with it. We actually gave it away for free. Millions of copies we gave away for free, but there were a few things that I asked everybody in there to do, and that was to stop eating out for at least six months. I thought the restaurant industry was going to explode. They could not believe that I said that. However, there was a white paper done from Mint, which was a finance app, and the number one debt that people had when they had a lot of credit card debt, the number one thing they actually spent money on to be in debt was eating out. Hmm. So that's when that started with me.
For me, myself, sure, I'll eat out if it's a business thing or we're away and I don't have whatever. But even when we travel, it's very funny. Maybe we'll go somewhere to do a speaking engagement and we go on a private plane. Okay. And now we bring our food with us and we check into the hotel. And even though the sponsor will pay for our food, we cook in our hotel room. Yeah. So we have a little hot plate. We do this. So I personally don't enjoy eating out at a restaurant just to go out and eat out only because I just, I don't know. I think the food's better at home and healthier. Well, you That's don't even have to use a hot plate if you got Wahoo with you all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, we bring that as well because we love Wahoo sashimi. Yeah, yeah exactly. there you go. Yeah, so, so a lot. But if you're there for a long time, because sometimes you're a place for a while, then we had a little hot plate. We had a little, you know, fry pan, a little this and a that. And we'd go to the grocery store if we ran out of food and bring it. So it was always, people would always laugh at us as they would see us checking into a hotel. <laughs> Susie, I saw a photo where it looks like you, um, I might be looking at it wrong, but I feel like there's a photo where you're sitting there with a rockfish with a yes. lingcod that looks like it came up with, yes. like you caught the rockfish, but landed a lingcod and a rockfish. Yeah. So there we are. Cause every year we also like to eat salmon. So we usually go to either Alaska or British Columbia to catch our own salmon. Great. And so there we were, and I was fishing, and I was actually fishing. I didn't even, you know, we had caught our quota of salmon and, his, and halibut. So I was just kind of fishing, and I caught something, and I'm bringing it up, and I'm like saying to KT, KT, this is, well, I don't know what I got here, but I don't think this is just a rockfish, because we wanted a rockfish in order to make tacos out of it. Yep. And all of a sudden, I bring it up, and it's a lingcod. That Sweet. bit it, would not let go, and so we caught both, and we bought both home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, give us a couple, um, give people a couple, we'll let you go after this, but give people a couple tips on, um, on, on how they should handle their tax refunds. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that you don't advise people to go with the play where you get the refund later. Yeah, as well, good as that feels. Thing, right. When interest rates were at 0% and there was nobody was making any money on CDs or money market accounts or anything, then I didn't have a problem with people getting a refund because they really weren't losing any money that way, truthfully. Yeah. However, now that interest rates in money market funds, and this will change, are at about 45 or 5%, or there's places that you can put money that are safe and sound and get a high interest rate, who wants to give the government an interest-free loan over a year's period of time of about 5%? You have to be out of your mind. <laughs> so you would be far better off now getting no refund, paying what you need to pay and not paying over it. So just come out so it's a zero. And in the long run, you're actually making more money. So that's how you make more out of less, to tell you the truth. So it's less of a refund, but in the long run, that extra money that they're keeping, you would just be able to take that money and put it in an account for yourself. Maybe buy some Bitcoin with it. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Susie Orman, thank you so much for coming on. Good luck on your next fishing trip. I really appreciate you joining us, and that's going to get everybody really pepped up and ready to do their taxes. All right, sweetheart. All talk right. to you thank soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, oh, you know what's funny? Uh, so, Becky, we're going to... How you doing? I'm good. Did you learn anything there? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't own a big boat. I don't oh. own... Just little boats. And, okay. and, um, and I try and balance my taxes, so it comes out even at the end of the year. But I do have advice for people that do get a refund. Okay. And they need to donate it to conservation. Oh, there you go. Yep. And and Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership would be a great place to put it too. That's excellent. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna talk about that a whole bunch. But I gotta run a, I, I'm gonna run a couple of Michigan things by you. And then okay. a neighboring thing, a, a neighboring thing from uh a neighboring thing from Wisconsin. Um a handful of things we're gonna talk about. But uh 
just a funny letter that came in. So Pat Dirk and um he comes on the show a lot. Uh the last outdoor columnist. Um he wrote a newspaper column last week. This is a while ago now. I'm looking at an old line. But uh Durkin wrote a piece about the continued decline in Wisconsin's deer hunting population. Meaning the number of people buying deer licenses in Wisconsin um is going down, down, down. You might be sitting, well, why isn't my why aren't my permissions going up, up, up? Which is a very long, complicated story. But those things do not uh, walk in tandem. Anyways, he gets a letter from a guy who <laughs> it's one of my favorite letters. And <laughs> the reason I like this letter so much is it just so happens that I'm leaving in two days to participate in Wisconsin's youth turkey season. But a guy writes in who's who right in response to Durkin's column writes in and, and it's signed Dave, a Michigan pissed hunter. <laughs> <laughs> goes on to say though Wisconsin just like Michigan has the same problem and I'll tell you what from a guy that has hunted all his life when you turn over a gun to a kid and they're allowed to shoot any bucks that they want and I've been hunting for the past 40 years and I have to settle for what's left over and you wonder why people are quitting you take all the hunt away before the season gets to the big hunt of the big opening day most of the big bucks are already gone you have so many hunts kids Special hunts, expo, regular bow. The regular opening day big hunt is a big flop. Kid hunts and they early hunts and stuff. Take the big bucks before the day gets here. And you might think the big day is just about the meat. And it's not. It's the racks. Michigan proved that with giving doe tags 12 total. But at a cost and hunters, let them walk. Want more hunter? Cut the bull crap. Give the big bucks back to the opening day big hunts. You might start to see some other people come back if it might already be too late. Dave, <laughs> a Michigan <laughs> pissed on her. Oh, I think I know That's, Dave. I think I've met <laughs> Dave. <laughs> that is one impassioned. That is one. I, I assume you read it as it was punctuated. I tried to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Pat was thinking it'd be a great T-shirt. Because I had the same thought. Like I have this T-shirt on of the guy that wrote in the story. Just thinking about that one. Yeah, yeah. The guy that wrote in the story about the just some unseemly behavior he was seeing among turkeys in his neighborhood. And I think that that might be a great T-shirt. You've met Dave. I'm sure I've You've met, met Dave. Dave all through your career. <laughs> all probably. through my career. His cousins. There are, there are yeah. more than one Dave in, in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Big well, family tree. Yeah. I'll translate that. Um, I'll translate that and be that uh, they've done so much. Do I need to translate it? I think it's a little fairly, bit. Yeah. 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 Now you got the archery season, and you got the crossbow season, and you got the youth season. But it's really the kids. And by the time it comes down to opening day in Michigan, November 15th, the big hunt, I like he calls it, the big hunt. The big hunt, yep. By the time the big hunt starts, opening day of general firearm, the kids have killed off all the big bucks. (laughs) So if you're trying to wonder what happened to all the hunters, that's it. By providing <laughs> special experiences for everyone, you may be diluting a singular experience that used to be for everybody. Mm. There's that was that saying, uh, he who is a friend to all is a friend to none. Oh. Mm. And our memory gets a little cloudy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have a, a deer on on the wall of one of the bedrooms in my home that my dad's first buck my dad shot in Michigan. And it was a huge buck by his standards. It was a nine point, about this big, mm. you know. <laughs> and the and the success rate back at that time when he shot that for firearm deer hunting in Michigan was about, it was below thirty percent mm. for the entire deer season. You know, Michigan has been over forty percent for quite a while now for firearm hunters in terms of success. So and. And our deer herd, you know, the antler size has also gone up. But, you know, the majority of bucks out there, you guys know this, are young bucks. I mean, we exploit deer pretty heavily in this country, especially in the Midwest where you have an open entry system. 
So people take a lot of deer. There's no doubt about it. But the majority of your deer are those younger deer. And I think sometimes our memory gets a little faded on the glory years oh. <laughs> and what it looks like. Not that that happened to Dave or anything. <laughs> but, you know, the other part of it is we are losing um, more and more hunters as a percentage of the population. And you guys know this. Yeah. And, you know, it threatens our our acceptance out there. It threatens our our clout as in politics and voting and regulations. And, and quite frankly, I... You know, I'm more than willing to give up that big buck for a youngster. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I by the time you get to Dave's age, hopefully he's taken a few nice bucks. I don't know if Dave has. <laughs> I don't know if Dave has either. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully you have and you've had that opportunity. But it is about maximizing opportunity out there for a lot of folks. And And Michigan, during those glory years, Michigan had over a million hunters. They're down under half a million now. What? Uh huh. And so with that, your you know your competition out on the landscape overall is down from what it had been. Yeah, but I think greater fragmentation of the landscape, right? Which is yeah, a greater fragmentation. We used to see in Michigan. Michigan carried most of their deer herd in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower Peninsula. And everybody had their little hunting camps and the rest of it. Now, the majority, we kill more deer in southern Michigan than the UP and northern Michigan combined. It's just, you know, we've seen this, you know, and not only Michigan, you see a lot of deer down Indiana, Illinois. The deer population, quite frankly, is much higher than it had been 50 years ago. Becky, I didn't do a good job of introducing you yet, but I'm going to do that right now. Um, Becky Humphreys is a... Long time biologist, started her career at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, then worked her way up through the Michigan DNR to become the director of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, spent time at Ducks Unlimited, ran um, national, uh, ran, ran NWTF as the CEO for how many years? CEO for five years. So five years heading the National Wild Turkey Federation. And then right now, and I owe you big thanks on this, has stepped in as the interim CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Conservation Partnership. And there's a permanent search underway, but you That's very true. graciously at very short notice came on board to, to run the organization during the interim. So I owe you a huge thanks there. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a great organization, as you know. We both sit on the board. And, um, you know, when we lost our CEO in pretty, you know, short order last last winter, uh, it's one of those organizations you don't want to see flounder. You mm-hmm. want them to have a great CEO and you want them to have great leadership. So it was an honor to be asked. And, and quite frankly, I was failing retirement pretty much anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try again. You know, try, try well, again. You'll, 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 get, you'll get to retire again. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, the uh, last last call on on live tour tickets. So the live tour starts next week. You're listening to this right around tax day. The live tour starts on on the 23rd. Live tour starts on the 23rd. Um, hang on a second. Let me pull this up. Yeah, I who's got the who's got the dates handy? Here, I got it. One minute. One minute. Damn it. Okay, ready. April 23rd, we're going to be in Mesa, Arizona. Three people not from Arizona, that means Phoenix. But not. April 24, San Diego, California. April 25, Anaheim, California. April 27, Sacramento. April 29, Salt Lake City. April 30, Boise, Idaho. Then May 1, Missoula, Montana. May 2, Spokane, Washington. May 4, Portland, Oregon. And then closing out the show, Cinco de Mayo. Is that right? Yes, mm-hmm. no dose trees. Mm-hmm. Cinco de Mayo, May fifth, <laughs> Tacoma, Washington. Yeah, uh, a couple of things for folks searching for tickets. Be sure to either go through the MeatEater dot com events page. Yep, and hit those links, or the venues. The venues only those two places. If you just type in. Uh, these shows in the Google machine. You'll want uh, you want the resellers, and it is grossly expensive. Yeah. So go th- go through the mediator.com events page, uh, or directly to um, the theater that is hosting the show. 
and then on top of that, if you want to try to win some tickets, there are pint nights hosted by BHA oh, there you go. Um, that precede all of these shows where you can actually participate in meat eater trivia. You can win a bunch of free stuff, including seats to the show. And including a seat on stage playing the game, right? Well, yeah, but we got to find, did we finalize the game? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Get on stage, match your wits. Uh, Oh, also when you buy tickets, here, here's the other, here's the other tidbit. I'll throw in the last little thing. You can see it both ways, but when you buy tickets, it comes bundled with the Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook. Wild game recipes for the grill smoker, camp stove, and campfire. Brand spickety new outdoor cookbook that we have out right now. And I've been struggling a little bit because I'm starting to put some pictures from the book up on Instagram. And, I, and I'm like, I put one up about, uh, I'm putting one up about, in the beginning of the book, we talk about like all this ancient cooking methods. Stuff dating back to the Ice Age and, and ways people did things. So when you open the book, I realized that one of the first things you see is a marmot who's had all of his hair burned off, which is like how small, it's like how small game was cooked at a time. You'd burn all his hair off and roast it whole. And then you'd, its skin would turn like a case. And then you open it up and the meat inside was steamed. And I wonder when people see that, if they can picture that they're also going to eventually wind up later in the book reading about a charred lemon gin and tonic. So the or old, do they think they're like, what in the, yeah, the hell? Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> don't judge a book by the first spread. <laughs> don't judge a book by the intro photos. Don't judge well, a book by the singed marmot. I've been thinking about, I've been waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about those fish cakes we made last week oh, from the dude. cookbook. And now I think I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and have this vision of a charred marmot. Well, think about charred lemon gin and tonics, mm. washing that charred marmot back. <laughs> <laughs> Becky, what's your take on the gray wolf that just got killed in southern Michigan? Ooh. How's that for transition? That that's a quick U turn. I don't you know, I don't know enough about that particular animal to speak to it. Just but, it walked it took it a went, hell of a walk, right? Yeah, but I mean it wouldn't surprise me. We wound up having a gray wolf that we had collared in the upper peninsula that walked to Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I mean wolves That sucker crossed the Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, it crossed a hell of a lot of territory between... Do you think it ran on a bridge? I <laughs> swam. That's a big swim. It could be a big swim. But, you know, um, who knows? You know, whether it probably, you know, they can swim well. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, and we know they cross ice bridges whenever there are ice dams. And we know, we know they'll cross bridges, too, you know, when, they, when it's low activity and the rest of it. So, but... Um, we've had, we've had wolf sightings in the Northern Lower Peninsula during heavy freeze over, you know, across, Coming the, across bridge. the ice. Yeah. yeah. And so they come across the ice. We just haven't been able to see, find a den or anything, you know, in the Northern Lower while I was still there. So it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we've had black bear in Southern Michigan for, well, 30 years now. Yeah. You we've know? got a lot of black bears in Central and Northern Michigan, you know. We you know. do. We do. Um, the wolf was killed by a, uh, the wolf was killed by a, a, this is odd, was killed by a guided coyote hunter. There was a guy on a guided coyote hunt. Killed an 87 pound gray wolf. They're holding the body. You know, gray wolves are federally protected. Yeah. Um, in there. And they're holding the body for a necropsy. And I think someone said, I think that we'll find that it was shot. <laughs> <laughs> but also checking its uh, parasite load and maybe try to get some idea where it came from. Yeah, they'll probably do DNA testing on it, too. To yeah, I'm who, sure there's a pretty good mm -hmm. DNA database, right? So they can tell yeah. who's breeding with who and mm -hmm. where the kids go. Before the show started, you and I talked about another Michigan thing I'd like you to speak to. And you said you were disappointed on it. Um I've communicated with uh, folks from Michigan United Conservation Clubs on this. Is that that explain how coyote management just changed in Michigan? Well, the commission, Natural Resources Commission, just voted to close down the coyote season for several months of the year. Up until now, coyotes have been legal to be taken at any time. But how far back does that go? Oh, it. Let's see. I probably. We probably made that change in the 
80s or 90s. Okay. Mm. As coyotes moved into southern Michigan and, yep. and populations, we really saw a big increase across, you know, most of Michigan and across most of the Midwest. Coyote populations took off and and people were seeing da- damage from them, um, depredation. And so with that, we opened up, you know, the ability to take coyotes just about any time, all year round. And so this shuts it down for a period of the year. Now, here's, let me give you my two different ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. One hand, on one hand, I I had a hard time getting worked up about it, the change, because I was thinking to myself, um, they are at, they are pursued as a fur bearer by trappers. Okay. They are. Trappers and hunters. Mm-hmm. And if you go back any length of time, I mean, before the real big, big ex- population explosion in the South, I mean, they were just like a, a, a staple fur bear and were viewed as such, right? That's true. Uh, Red Fox, op- what season opens October 15th, whatever mm-hmm. the hell it is. There was a season uh, raccoon, depending on where you're at in the state, you might have a uh, November 1 opener on raccoon. Uh Quick context, Muscat, we have a, otter, beaver. a beautiful coyote hide um, Oh, in, in prime condition at like 750 bucks on the auction house of oddities right now. Yep, right off this wall. But it, to the point that you were making, it's taken during a season where that hide is... Prime. Prime. It's, yeah. That's right. Full of fur because it's cold out. December, January. Was that yours from Montana? It's mine from Montana, okay. from the winter season, from the wall of the studio here. Mm. That makes you realize it's like one of good, those is seven fifty. Good chunk of money right now. Right they're there. one, two, they're like. <laughs> but there's four there's a time. I know how many are there? I know Corinne's gonna start. <laughs> now I'm gonna start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a time in the season where that hide is not prime because it's warm, and it's much more thin, and it would not command the same amount of value on like an open fur market. Yes. And so the, I won't argue with you there. You don't want to Well, you got to let me finish making yeah. my two points. Okay. All right. Number one. That was the number one point. Yep. I couldn't get worked up about it because of that. But uh, here's what I do get worked up about. Is I do get worked up about it of when um, when they start, when people start changing rules, and I don't necessarily agree with why they changed it. Meaning, if it had been the trappers or hunters or the fur people saying, what gives? Um, why are you guys killing coyotes in the spring when it's pup, when se- not with pup season yeah. and they're, they're not worth anything to anyone anyways? Why not leave them for people that, that, that want to utilize them or make a few bucks on them later in the year? But, it, but, it, but so in your explanation of this, who was pushing for the change? Like, was it coming from... From them or no, someone else? No, it was not coming from the hunters and the trappers. So, you know, it was coming from individuals who do not like the idea of year-round killing of coyotes. Mm-hmm. And I think the commission was uncomfortable with that. Um, but like you said, you you held the same opinion I do. It's it's not coming from the segment that wants to have that population managed for maximum value out there. Um, it's being taken because we don't like the thought of taking coyotes at that time of year. So what's happening now is for individuals who have chickens or individuals who who are out there and have deprivation issues, now they've got to go through getting a permit in order to take those animals out of season. And I assume they'll be able to do it. But every time you do that, you're you're tying up a biologist, time and energy to issue a permit for what have been going on where they could be actively managing some habitat so that you would have better habitat on the landscape. You'd have better population management. You know, it's... And it's a species that we really can't yeah, it's, put a dent in. No, it's super abundant. And so, you know, let's let's be realistic about it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those situations where people might not like the thought of it, but it's is part of reality that coyotes do get in trouble. Um, They do cause depredation issues for people out there. Uh, Uh, Doug Duran points out correctly so that uh, the pro argument for year-round coyote hunting is it's a super abundant resource. It Um, is. And 
the anti argument overlaps with that also, where it's like, it's a super abundant resource. Uh, and hunting hasn't been proven to dent that resource. So why are you hunting it? Mm. Because hunting isn't yeah. managing the population. Whatever it's, you're doing is not working. Right. Oh, I can see that. Argument. Yeah. 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 That that's one of the, that's like a little bit of a tongue twister when it comes to coyotes is you'll often have people point out that, that with, with when you're hunting coyotes, you'll offset pack dynamics and it'll actually lead to fragmentation and more pup production. Meaning you'd have this, this hierarchy that had some sort of limit on who's reproducing. And then as you, if, if you kill dominant animals, you cause these like splintering factions and, and it generates more pup production. So kind of being a smart ass, you might say, well, if you love coyotes, why would you not want coyote hunting because you love coyotes and it seems to be really making a lot more of them, you know, meaning I love deer. If I found that there was something hunters were doing that was like producing tons of giant bucks, I would be like, please continue. Let's continue this because I love these <laughs> giant bucks, but they're saying like, I love coyotes. Don't kill coyotes because it just makes more coyotes, which is like I said, it's an intellectual tongue twister. I think it's less it's that they love twister. coyotes than they don't love the idea of killing coyotes. I think that that's exactly <laughs> yeah, I think right. so too. And and it's not just coyotes, it's canines. I mean, we see it with the wolf population too. Um, we've listed and delisted wolves over and over again in Michigan and the Western Great Lakes population. And, you know, the solution when we had depredating or when we had problem wolves that were getting in and causing problems when we couldn't do lethal take, and there was a time when we couldn't, was to trap those wolves and move them. And where are you moving them? Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> You're moving them into the territory of another pack. God. Yeah. Oh. Where they're going to get, get brutally dismembered. It's basically like a death sentence. Right. It's a death it's sentence. A, it's, yes. a, it's a brutal death sentence, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. I think... That's interesting, yeah. One interesting thing, we just, just saw it with this... Uh, wolf that, that got killed in, in Southern Michigan is, um, the success of the anti, uh, killing of wolf party is, a, the death of an individual animal is a paper thin degree away from the extirpation of the species as a whole. So when you talk to somebody, well, they just kill the wolf. They're going to kill all the wolves mm. where it's like, you just whacked a white-tailed deer with your bumper for the seventh time this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That doesn't equate to killing all the whitetails. Nope. No, and those charismatic species are special. So uh, who are you going to vote for for president? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you oh, were at... when you were at, charisma. Yeah, yeah, when you were yeah. at... Uh, when you ran the the fish and game department in Michigan. Uh -huh. Um, in a role like that, how, how do you grab, like in a role like that, how do you, how do you, how do you got to handle partisan politics? Well, you know, first of all, as a, as a state employee, which I was, you got to be real careful. You can't get engaged in partisan politics. Uh -huh. You can't do, you know, you can't do partisan fundraisers that tie your name into, um, you know, advocating for one party or one candidate or another. You've got to be really careful with the Hatch Act that you don't engage in in advocating for certain issues that go to the public. Do you, do you stop? Did you just, do you stop voting? No. You still vote? No, I still vote. Yeah. Okay. And I vote, I vote primaries the whole nine yards. Um, okay. And um, always have, always will. You know, I, it's, it's my right to help decide who gets elected, and um, I think everybody should engage and vote how they feel most, you know, the candidates that best represent their views. But you keep quiet about it. When, yeah, you when know. You're at, when, you're in, when you're in wildlife management at the state level. Yeah, you really can't, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I worked for both Republican and Democratic administrations, mm -hmm. and... You know, it's tough because there's a lot of fundraising that goes on as you get into campaigns and get ready for election years. And you 
and you wind up um, having to be very careful. I was I was lucky. I had a commission that helped do fundraising, you know, for gubernatorial elections when it was expected that cabinet members would do that, which I was a cabinet member. But as you know, as an employee, I can't do that. I can't get into the partisan. So very much bipartisan. You try and work with both parties. Unfortunately, that middle ground is disappearing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's hard. And I I tend to be a moderate in my political views. You know, I step on both sides of the aisle. I tend to be fiscally conservative and a little more liberal on some of the social issues. And so be, between those, trying to find that common ground, you know, is really hard because the parties have, we've lost the We've lost the conservative Democrats and the and the more liberal Republicans. They're just fading away. You wanted something spicier than that, Steve? No, 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 no. no. I'm not. Fr- I'm not frustrated. With anything you're saying, I just. Um, I feel that they're faded away. They're faded away from the areas where you hear from people. I think they're faded away in our elected representation sure yeah. because you know yes, it, 100%. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i i don't think you know and i think we hang with people that tend to share our views you know they share our activities so i agree with you i think there are a lot of folks out there that are like me you know when i talk to folks they they express similar views and i don't think it's just because they're trying to impress me that we're so much alike i think they probably do but both parties have taken over so such non-overlapping issues. It makes it really difficult. I hang with people that share my activities, but then um, not the views. Oh, I, I will agree with you there. Yeah. Some of my dear, dear friends, I feel have some just ridiculous viewpoints. <laughs> but I, forg- <laughs> I, for- I forgive them it because they like to fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes for interesting conversations. Uh... And the older I get, the more now when I hear one, I don't even, like, I, I, I used to be like, I'd, I'd want to argue it. No. But now I'm just mm. like, oh, that's, yeah. uh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Once you start that argument, it's ending the argument that becomes the problem. Yeah. Yep. No, I look for, um, I look for, uh, I sort of am running this thing in my head. Where I'm always like, when you cut all the bullshit out, are they a good person? And, yeah. you know, I'm like, yeah, man, they're a great person. Well, do I trust and, them? Do I trust them yeah, to lead the I, country well, or the state or to make... To make wise decisions. Yeah, but then am I going to go ask them where I think, where they think COVID came from or whatever? You know, I don't know. Like, I might ask them where that fish they caught came from. <laughs> 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 so in the, so now, right, like you, you've ran, you ran a big national um, conservation organization, mm-hmm. which everybody's heard of, National Wild Turkey Federation. You're at the helm right now of another federal policy conservation group. TRCP. Yep. Uh, how does an organization, how, how do these organizations handle the partisan question? Meaning, here we are, we're coming up on a, a, an election cycle, which I feel like it's already been going on for three years. Oh but, my gosh, I know. But it's, it's I guess, starting, it started, starting, it's going to heat up. It's going to be the most, well, we're going to have the most expensive. It's just going to be a wonderful year. <laughs> we're going to have the most expensive presidential election ever. And I, th- and I don't know if that really says anything about that just might say something about the fact that every four years it's more expensive. I don't know. Most expensive, hotly contested presidential yeah, some, election. There's some records that I don't really pay much attention to. And when everything is like the most expensive we've had yet, I think that's sort of a function of... Yeah. yeah. Adver- spending, adver- yeah, yeah. Advertising is expensive. In mm-hmm. four years, it'll be the most expensive. It's every, yeah. every one has been the most expensive. I don't think we're going to get to a point in my adult life where we're like, man, this election was half the cost of yeah. the last one. The least expensive <laughs> election we ever had. I think, though, in state politics, especially uh, some of these Western states that do not have large populations comparatively, mm-hmm. that's where those those numbers matter. Like, I look at the amount of cash that's going to be spent and is being spent on the gubernatorial race right now. Yeah. Relative to our size. Oh, like the dollars per person. Mm-hmm. The dollars per person. And, it's, it's and they're dollars. going to spend it. Yeah, it's dollars. Yes, not portions, not (laughs) fractions of dollars. And they're going to spend it, which means we are going to get robocalls, 
text in, you know, just like mm-hmm. those political ads are going to be served to us every which way possible for, and in, in an increasing manner, like it does not bode well for the mental health of Montanans. <laughs> No, you know, when, uh, when Davy Crockett was running for Congress, he would do a little thing where if you came down and voted for him, you, you'd get a shot of whiskey. <laughs> mm-hmm. You could, with the money they're spending, you could, they could hand out bottles of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. It yes, is, come on and vote. It is expensive. And, and elections and campaigns have gone to micro-targeting. Mm-hmm. So they've segmented, you know, they can tell now how you vote. You know, even if you're in a state that you don't have to declare your party, they can tell by your voting record what you, when you vote, what you, which party you're most likely to vote for. And they know, you know, is it, you know, are you a big fan of police protection or not? Are you, where do you stand on right to life? They have all that information. So when they go out and start walking for candidates, knocking doors, which they do in hotly contested areas, they're pulling literature that pertains to your interest. That's really interesting you bring that up because the other day, one of the, we had a Senate, a representative from a Senate candidate knock on the door wanting to speak to my wife. And when I informed him that she wasn't there, I thought, well, now I'm going to get the pitch. He just walked off. That's amazing. He knew he knew who he was there to <laughs> talk to. He knew who he was there to talk to. That's right. So as you look at this, as as you look at the landscape, like how do you guys how how does the game work? Because here here at TRCP. Yep. Uh speak from that seat or the NWTF seat, whatever. No matter what administration comes in, you need to come, you're gonna need to go to the administration. Right or or, right. or or to appointees or mm-hmm. however you're going to need to go there and 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 say uh, let's work together. That's right. So, uh, but you can't you can't make a big bet in one direction and then when they lose you'd be like I guess we're out of the game for four years. Well, you can't. So you're what are you doing? Like how how are you how are you doing this? Well, a couple things. You know, first. We and others in the conservation community, we being TRCP, sit down and and identify our policy objectives. What are real priorities for us, you know, for the next administration, be it Biden to be it Trump to. And write those up so that we can share those with those those campaigns, because they are this next year as they're campaigning, they're forming their policy planks for their administration. Mm -hmm. By the time they they have identified candidates for those cabinet posts, they will identify people based on some of the objectives they want to achieve. So we want to get into them before they're elected. And we do that with both parties. You know, you, you, we share those information. We try and go over that information with those campaigns so they understand why, why it's important to us. And then as, as we move forward and you have an election and, and administration comes on board, you need to get in there and build relationships. You won't always agree with everything. It doesn't matter what, what the administration is. You're going to disagree on certain things. But you need to have a working relationship. And you build that that trust that they will share information on what's coming out so that you can prepare for it, you can look for it. You can let them know where, where you see that it's going to be problematic, that mm. it hasn't been well thought out. You can... Um, Ask them to hold it over for more comment so that you can they can get a more robust view on some of the issues that you think are have been not taken into consideration or even hold off on a rule or or piece of legislation that you think is bad for it. And um, by doing that, you try and build that working relationship and trust with that administration. And then, you know, you're careful in terms of being true to your position so that if you disagree with something, you do it in a manner where you don't surprise them. You know, it's okay to disagree on stuff, but nobody likes being surprised. So let them know why you don't like it and, and bring the information on why you think it's hasn't been well thought out, make the ask. And then if you have to do editorials or sign on letters or, you know, um, come out strongly on it, they know, they know, 
that you don't agree with it. They knew it was going to happen and yep. you, you're thinking on it. Yep. Well, do you run, um, you talk about like you have your plan for the next administration. You have to run like parallel, two paths, right? Because yep. Yep. you might be looking at, like, let's say you're looking at, you're talking about Biden too, okay? Yep. With that, you'd say, well, um, there's a clear pathway to climate issues. There's a clear pathway to wildlife overpasses through infrastructure spending, right? Yeah. But there was in the Trump administration, too. Is that right? Yeah. Trump administration was very supportive of those migration corridors, and they actually dedicated some funding to to it. So both administrations are on that. But like Biden, we're looking at alternative energy. But the BLM solar plan, this is one that we have an editorial coming out on. Joel's got an editorial on it. We're bit concerned with sure. with what they're identifying in terms of placement in those migration corridors for solar. Do you I mind? Just, do you just mind? talk to a lot of Idaho folks who are real, yeah. real fired mm-hmm. up because the BLM plan in uh, Southwest Idaho, the Owyhee down where Snort got bit, but there's also California bighorn sheep, super like the genetics for like that really wide ass mule deer buck mm-hmm. that down in that country and, and big old pronghorn sage grouse. So we, Very sensitive area. We're not opposed to alternative energy by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, we need to move into alternative energy. We just want it to be carefully thought out. You know, we need we need working landscapes that provide great habitat, but also provide, you know, clean water, clean air, food that we like to enjoy, and energy. And so, but it's about doing the pre-work to make sure it's being placed in the appropriate locations that aren't going to have big big ramifications for some of the species that we hold near and dear. And I I think there's a huge misconception that if you're supportive of alternative energy, that you're supportive of it anywhere. And I think like from someone who as a former TRCP staffer, like the, the, um, some of the, like the, the sessions I remember of people really hand wringing and pulling their hair out or looking at maps of solar placement. Yeah. And like there's people on the ground working for, you know, that were supportive of alternative energy, but recognize the, the threat and the danger of citing it improperly. That's right. And so I think like there's a lot of back and forth if you follow the, the discourse about, you know, it's either one way or the other way. And there's people on the ground that are really diligently thinking about how do we stop this in places where it's going to have a huge impact on wildlife and, and how do we do it responsibly. And, and we can have both. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. When you look at the acreage requirements, we have more than enough acreage outside those corridors. Now, there might be other species and concerns or landscape characteristics, historical significance, you know, a range of issues. But nonetheless, we need to take into account these really critical areas. Um, we saw the same thing in Michigan with wind power. You know, when we were putting up wind turbines, the areas that had the greatest wind potential were right where birds migrated and it was that's going to be problematic i mean if you're killing birds like crazy when they're and we got wind turbines located all down the east side of the state which is a major flyway corridor for migratory birds that's a problem you know so we you know in that situation it was about pulling the right expertise together mapping it out and and looking at those wind maps and looking at that where those migration corridors were and finding solutions to it. So you're placing alternative energy where it's going to be beneficial and not harmful to those species. Uh, let me back up on a thing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to like drive you to give a drive you to give an answer you're not comfortable with, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just not clear on it. Yeah. When we talk about this, this um, like administration planning, do do you develop two or do you develop one and like you develop one plan for the next four years and you're presenting it to each campaign? No, we, we do two. Yeah. Um, I mean, for one thing, parties talk different language. Um, they use different phraseology, even though they might um, have the same issue, mm-hmm. but they talk about it in different terms. Okay. And so you want, you want the, the particular party that you're, going towards to embrace this and and use it. I mean, you want it to be their recipe book coming out. So you want it to be put in terms that 
resonate with other parts of that party plank and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and there, there are certain elements that are going to be more attractive to one party over the other. Um, they just are. I mean, you know, by and large, you'll see more emphasis put on renewables with the Democratic Party and um, security with oil security that's talked about more in Republican. Now, in reality, we just we have produced more oil and gas in this country with each administration, despite the party, in recent years. Is that right? So, yep. Mm-hmm. It's been ramping up. Like at a record high right yeah, now in terms of oil produced in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And huh. people don't recognize that, but it's true. We have. It's part of our national security plan. Gotcha. I understand what you're saying with tailoring it and that. Yeah, and there are also... And, and there's probably cases where you're going to... There's probably cases where you're going to drive at, um, there's probably cases where you're, you're asking for the same thing, but you're phrasing it as a different priority. Yeah. And totally. there, are, there are also issues, you know, we tend to, the Republican party tends to be a little more states rights mm-hmm. than the Democratic party looks for national solutions um, on those issues. So, you know, that's another way that you're taking a look at it. You know, I'll, during the Trump administration, we saw a nice expansion in hunting and fishing on, on national refuge lands. Yeah, yeah. And not only did they do that, but speaking as a state director, one of the things I really liked is they they put out a, a mandate with that the regulations were going to be as close to the state regulations as they could be. So before you had, if you were going to hunt on... You know, refuge land, you might have different shell limits. You might have different days of the week that there was hunting. You might have all kinds of different requirements that were a little different season requirements than what you had at the state, on the state land. And that just gets complex. You know that. I know that. And so they tried to simplify that and bring the federal lands closer in alignment with the state regulations. Do you feel, is is there any rumor or anything around um would trump return to barnhart as his interior secretary bernhardt bernhardt sorry <laughs> is it was it david is that his name? yeah david, david. Yeah. yeah i don't know um hey, i do know that david has stayed very engaged in natural resource issues uh-huh. and um you know he was very loyal to trump um throughout the administration and even afterwards so yeah. I, I you know i I don't know, but I would assume he'll have some role in the administration. I uh, heard a um, a person very involved in conservation. I'm not trying to be like, you know, secretive. I just don't want to take a private conversation and, and apply it to someone. But someone very involved in conservation um, had said to me that what they what they liked about Trump's interior secretary, part two, mm-hmm. the second interior secretary, was that he would save you a lot of time uh, by saying, uh, buddy, you're not going to get anywhere on this with me. And it would allow you to focus on the areas where he said, let's have a conversation and would tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. And then, and then stick with that. Yeah. And he said it was, it just was, it was efficient. Yeah, I mean to 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 spend time and resource there because you never wound up being that you wasted a bunch of time on something that you didn't know that all of a sudden you're going to read in the newspaper that things went in a direction you didn't anticipate. He was an honest broker in terms of telling you where issues were going if there was already a thought on it. Mm-hmm. So, and and he he had researched issues also, so he had a pretty good handle on a lot of the conservation issues out there um, in that administration. You know, one of the things people probably don't realize is a lot of the staff support that comes in are the same folks. So you'll have administrations where, you know, a particular individual is in the administration, they're a staff person, and you might switch parties for four years or eight years, but then you'll bring back a lot of those people that had worked during the previous Republican or Democratic administration because they kind of know the party priorities. Yep. And also they are very helpful in getting new candidates and new administrations in place and off to an effective start to move that agenda forward. Because mm-hmm. it's it's hard. Um, 
especially if somebody comes in from outside government, you've got to make an awful lot of appointments. You've got a, an awful lot to do to have executive orders written. And we've all seen there are more and more things being done by executive authority now. And administrations kind of flip-flop and reverse each other's executive order right out of the gate. And they do that by bringing back people who are knowledgeable, know how to write executive orders, and mm -hmm. are familiar with the topic and, and have experience in it. We recently had a guest on talking about offshore wind, mm -hmm. um, offshore wind, you know, electric, electricity generation. How, how do you? Yeah, wind power. Wind power. At the end of the interview, I said, so, you know, when Trump wins in November, where's all this sit? And, and he didn't have a great answer, but I felt like you could spend a lot of time working on something if you weren't being shrewd. You spend a lot of time working on something and then just have the rug ripped out from underneath you every four years. Oh, yeah. And and that's why administrations work so hard to get reelected and have at least an eight-year runway. Because it takes, you know, it takes a, really a couple years to get administration in and rolling to get all your your appoint, appointments confirmed and in there and start to implement that policy direction. And by then you're into the next election cycle and you're campaigning, the administration is. And so, you know, and and quite often what we'll also see is at the end of the administration, that's when the promises that were made when they came into office get, get right. run through. And some of those, quite frankly, can be quite ugly. Um, that's what I was going to ask is when... Because both candidates would be their their last term, last four. Yep. Right. So that's typically when, as you just said, like you get to capitalize on the early promises, some of the campaign promises that got them elected in the first place. That's or, right. Or one that uh, independent constituency. You right. Um, it, where like is there going to be such a restart? If Trump were to win, would it hinder that last four years of getting shit done? Oh, like is your yeah? With does the does the break does the four year vacation sabbatical right. interrupt the momentum that you would have had your second term momentum? Well, yeah, because yeah. what we saw no, right question. was like uh, I think uh, like Clean Water Act is always a, a great ping pong ball, mm -hmm. right? Like, God forbid we have somebody be like, yeah, some of that was okay. So we're just going to return <laughs> the pendulum to the middle. But instead you watch that pendulum go, wing, yeah. all the way back. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's crazy And we're seeing talent. more, more of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, that's what I'm, I'm wondering, right? Is like the first two years are just going to be like knocking those ping pong balls all the way back over uh -huh. to one side. Yeah. Right? You know, yes and no. I mean, they're going to, if a new administration comes in or even the current administration, they're going to have some individuals who do not, you know, cabinet members and other appointees, undersecretaries who will not persist through the second term of the administration or with the new administration, they'll have to name a whole new cabinet and, all those other appointed positions. And quite frankly, that takes a lot of time and energy. So um, they're, they'll... But, or as we've seen in the past, not appointing positions. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. Not appointing positions is also a tactic out there. Um, having interim folks and acting folks. That's an interesting there. tactic when you have divisions. When you can't get somebody confirmed. Well, yeah. no, no, I mean that also, but when you just have areas in which you're not that interested or that's you'd right. like to see downsize, it, it's it just oh, we don't saw, make the appointment. That's right. Yeah. Or And leave lots of vacancies yeah. in mm -hmm. the organization. Is there, um, is there an area potentially mm -hmm. with, say, renewables or energy production nationally uh, that that both administrations uh, kind of have more of an intersection or similar thinking on that you'd see as that uh, as that issue might um, have national security concerns, for example, with solar or offshore or... Well, both administrations have been ramping up 
you know, um, hydrocarbon production in the United States. So we're more self-sufficient there. Um, so that has been an ongoing trend, as we talked about. You know, um, I think yes and no. I think I think you're going to see both administrations wanting to get into market-based incentives that are out there. I mean, we've got to be able to make carbon part of the economy in order to treat it effectively. This is my two cents. I mean, we it doesn't make any sense to have national forests that are going up in flames mm -hmm. and burning fiber and causing tremendous degradation of habitats out there rather than removing some of that fiber, mimicking natural processes and using that fiber and actually storing that carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got to find ways that we can rebuild these local economies to have working landscapes. And we've lost a lot of that local rural economy. I mean, we don't have mills in, in much United States anymore in order to even handle that fiber. Mm -hmm. Part of our problem with, um, you know, there's been concerns with prescribed fire on the landscape because there have been a couple of fires that have gotten away from the Forest Service or state agencies that have been using it. But our, we're using prescribed fire sometimes in cases where it it's very different today than it used to be, where, you know, you might run fire through an oak savanna or a pine savanna, and in one day you, you know what the conditions are going to be. We can go out there and see what the humidity is. We have good weather satellite data. Now we've got big piles of logs that we have no mill to run it to. We got no log haulers to haul it to. So you got this huge pile of logs that have been cut and they're just stacked on the landscape. And we're using prescribed fire then to burn that pile of logs. Well, what happens mm -hmm. to that prescribed fire window? You know, anybody's had a big bonfire, you know, it goes from a one day fire. Right. Eventually you're standing around being like, oh my God, is this thing yeah. still yeah. going? <laughs> it's a multi-day yeah. multi fire. And then your chance of having fire escape from that, you know, you have winds come up and unexpected weather situations. When you have a big, big inferno going like that, you can't just kill it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's very difficult. You're talking about disposing of of stuff from thinning operations because yep. there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere That's to right. use, there's no way to use it economically Yeah, it might and be, put it to use so it just has to get torched. It might be a salvage cut that goes in. You might have a severe ice storm that comes in and closes roads and, and closes trails. You need to get that down material out of there. It might be wind throw. I mean, we have tremendous areas in the upper peninsula and lower peninsula, Michigan, where winds race across those lakes and they will... You know, at certain events will throw trees down. Yeah, it's like an avalanche path yeah. on mm -hmm. flat ground or relatively yeah. flat so, ground. You know, or it could be a thinning operation where you're degrading that forest. You're getting so much fiber and so much ladder fuel that's creating fire damage, you know, fire hazard and damage for the future of that forest. <laughs> so at that point, you want to remove it. Yep. But, you, you know, you want to remove it and be able to use that product if possible. And that's where we need to rebuild that infrastructure in some manner. How do you, as a, as a federal policy organization or, you know, or a conservation group with federal scope, national, national level scope, how, how do you guys come in and, uh, is it okay to come in and weigh in on appointments? Oh yeah. I mean, we were, we were talking about like interior secretary, like that, that, an administration when they when 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 a when an administration picks its its um secretary of the interior, you're sort of like looking at uh just this hugely impactful appointment. It's gonna be that's gonna be your enemy, that's gonna be your ally, right? Is it uh is there a pathway to come in and say, hey, that that choice um ain't gonna work? Yes, there have been in the past with the um, going in and saying, you know, this is just not an appropriate appointment mm -hmm. given, you know, what this person has done previously or what they are saying publicly on it or we have concerns about working with it. But typically what we try and do is weigh in early in terms of the types of expertise or major issues that we think are coming up that that the administration should look at and consider for appointments out there. And quite frankly, most administrations 
coming in, they ask key partner groups out there, who do you know? Who's, oh, did who's you? Good? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, they'll, they'll, so you get a chance, you could like slide a resume over. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Are you, are you up for that job? No. No? No. <laughs> no. You're not I, looking to retire no, into the no, interior? No, no, you don't no, want to no, be no, that no, unretired? No, no. <laughs> no. But, you know, I went in and interviewed for um, director of the Fish and Wildlife Service years ago. Okay. And that, that's how it was. I kept saying I wasn't interested in it. And it was like, we really want to talk to you. Just come in and talk to us. So I, I flew in, talked to him for a day and told him who I thought would be really good. But it wasn't me. You know, we needed to make deep cultural change in that organization at that time. And I really thought it needed to come from somebody within the organization. And and they did. Um, that person came in, Sam Hamilton came in and was very effective while he was there. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack way too early in life. Oh, I got it. Uh, before we start recording, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about when you hit to, uh, that you ran the, you ran the DNR in Michigan mm-hmm. and then later were asked, would you like to be a commissioner? And you felt that that was, uh, inappropriate to have like a former de- like a former department head sitting on the commission and, and having, I don't know, what what's a confused power dynamic? I well, I think it's difficult. I think it's def- difficult for private organizations or nonprofits to have their past CEO sit on their board of directors. Your board of directors is your boss. And to have your predecessor be your boss puts you in an uncomfortable situation when you know there are key initiatives or changes that person made and you're recommending something different. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I I didn't have to deal with that when I was director. I didn't have any past directors. In fact, yep. there haven't been past directors on the commission before until the person that followed me was was named on the commission for a short time. And and quite frankly, I talked to him about it. He said it was awful. You oh, know? okay. <laughs> you know, and the groups try and use you also. Um, you know, I, I get called now on issues where the sportsmen's groups don't necessarily agree with the decision and they want me to come out and publicly weigh in on it. Oh. And, you know, I'm not so sure my opinion at this point is any more important than anybody else's opinion out there. But the other part of it is... Um, you know, I think those jobs are really tough, and I don't want to make it tougher yeah. for that person. That uh, I, I was more bringing that up to tee up to a, a, another thing is you had said before we started recording today. You were talking about what you're seeing in general. Um, it, I'll have you put it in your own words, but like a general erosion of commission authority. Can, can you explain, can you real quick tell people, you know, speaking from that you got 50 of these things, like what are commissions and what do you mean by commission authority? Well, commissions, natural resources commissions, and they sometimes are called fish and game commissions, but typically they are appointed positions appointed by the governor. And then they are the body that either hires the director of the Department of Natural Resources or fish and game or whatever it's called in that state, or... Um, they are the decision maker on on hunting and fishing regulations. So you've got this this public commission with appointed people that help help insulate the departments directly from the the governor's office. So even though you're part of the executive branch, you know you don't you have a little bit of buffer in there, and they also provide some real transparency because typically those commissions don't pass regulations, they don't hire directors without public input. When I was hired, my interview was televised. So <laughs> it was, you know, it was a, a very public process um, that went through in terms of selection. Did they ask what your spirit animal was? <laughs> no, they didn't ask what my spirit <laughs> animal was. They asked an awful lot of other questions, though, I got to tell you. And, um, but you know, that, that process of gathering public input on various regulations is really important. And we are seeing now more and more um, directors are selected not by the commission, but by the governor. They become gubernatorial appointments, which occurred 
in Michigan when I was there. I was the last commission appointed and the first gubernatorial appointed director. So the commission, the director, the governor in the state passed an executive order that made that appointment her appointment rather than the commission's. Because they just didn't like what they were getting from the commission? Because well, they wanted it to be just like more an instrument of the administration? Like, what is the push? I think, you know, I think they, you know, what I heard was you want direct accountability of your cabinet members. But I really think when you get into office and you name your cabinet, you want to be able to name those cabinet members so that they're all people that are affiliated in helping move your agenda forward. Mm -hmm. And what the second thing that has happened with that, though, is the tenure of agency directors has shortened. Now the average tenure is less than three years. Well, it's hard to manage natural resources that have, you know, long history, Mm -hmm. lifespan, scientific, the whole nine yards on really short rotation. So, yes, I hear governors want that direct accountability, but having some some um, transition and having directors that span various parties, it's not all bad. Mm-hmm. It's good, I mean, in my opinion. And I think having the commission in there, and most of your commissions are required to be bipartisan. So they, have, they call for, in various states, you know, commissioners either represent a geographic location or they represent political party. Yeah, or... or- uh, in, in, or factions of industry. Yeah. Meaning yeah. Com- like guys, yeah. and out- guys and outfitters, commercial interests. Forestry, right? agriculture, agriculture yeah. you name where it. Where you're trying to strive yeah. for some level. And I mm-hmm. think that, and I've heard, um, and maybe it's just a tradition in Washington, but regionality. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you specified regionality yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, because there so are many region- from the, you know, they west are- of the Cascades, east of the Cascades. That's whatever. right. Yeah. So, uh, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. But with that, what we're seeing is those commissions are both their authorities getting nipped back, you know, sometimes through state law, the, mm. you know, legislators are trying to enact laws on taking of game and fish species mm-hmm. or the method of take. And then the other way is they're losing their authority to appoint also. Appoint. Mm-hmm, appoint your directors. The director, yeah, mm-hmm. got it. Mm-hmm. And, and you generally... Um, are uneasy with this. I am. I think it creates more partisan politics into the natural resource arena. And I think it creates more of these shifts. And just like we talked about with executive orders that swing so far one way and then the other way, you know, that's that you waste a lot of time and energy. Yeah. Yeah. Be like, ladies and gentlemen, we're all in on renewables. Then ladies and gentlemen, we're all in on hydrogen. (laughs) Slow down the pendulum a little bit. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I got a last question for you that's a little more complicated, but uh, just an observation about the, the the wild pendulum swings. On, I mean, people people like to bitch about gridlock, but I always like to remind folks that this is quite intentional. Um, you know, we could be like Venezuela, you know, hey, we're communists, and then like a couple months later, hey, we're ultra right, hey, we're back to communists. I mean, those are, you know, when people bitch about gridlock. It's going to have a little effect on your bank account. When people yeah. bitch about gridlock and all this, it's like, it's, this is in, intentionally constructed that we don't go down wild ass, that you, you you can't harness the moment and go in wild directions all the time. That's right. And so, so I don't like, I, I get aggravated about the things that I want to happen that don't happen quickly. But in general, it's like, it's. But some, as long as some stability, the other people's stuff is going just as slow, <laughs> it's better. Well, yeah, actually, I, well, if I don't get what I want and they don't get what they want, then I feel okay about it. <laughs> Our issues tend to do really well, though, during gridlock. So, you know, here's the other part of it is we might get frustrated, but we are usually um, highly effective when Congress or state legislatures cannot agree on issues. Our conservation issues usually do really mm. well because... You can be the the awesome person who says, "Hey, I got something that everybody will like." Yeah, and that's it's like, exactly right. right. You're, not, you're, you're like, there's no, okay. there's no like hot button social issue wrapped up into it. Well, that's right. Yeah. I mean, in, in DNR, we used to call ourselves the Department of Fun. <laughs> who doesn't want to support the Department of Fun? I mean, you have hunting, you have camping, you've got timber industry, you've got fishing and yeah. and hunting and and wildlife viewing. So, I mean, but most of our legislation. 
we work in a bipartisan manner anyhow to try and get things so that you have both sponsors of bills on the right and the left mm -hmm. and then introduce those and try and keep them fairly evenly matched. So those we tend to be highly successful during periods of gridlock when Congress can't deal with the other stuff. And they need to have something That's they can right. they need to have they something to bring they can point home. to. Yeah. Yeah. They need to bring it back I, to their constituents. You know, I supported this bill. And, that's right. You know. uh, here's, the one that's a little, this, here's the one that's more complicated. It's not complicated to answer. It's complicated to ask. Uh, everyone loves to talk to gripe about ballot box biology, ballot box initiatives. And also, uh, I find this is an area that really accentuates a lot of hypocrisy. Meaning, um, I'm very supportive of the ballot initiatives that guarantee the right to hunt, trap, and fish. Okay? So I'll be like, hell yeah, vote yes this November for your state's right to hunt and fish. Okay? Then the next time some a ballot initiative comes up that I don't like, I'll be like, there you go, damn it. Ballot box biology, right? Putting That's it to true. the voters. That's not how you do it. But a minute ago, I was just avid, you know what I mean? A minute ago, I was just saying. When I you was can get the uninformed <laughs> masses yeah. to vote your way, it's a great thing. So people love, right? Like everybody complains about it, but they complain about it only when there's a ballot box initiative that they hate. True. And when there's ones they support, they're getting out the vote. Well, it's like people don't really complain about judicial activism when the courts are finding in their favor. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. So here's the question. That, that, was just a, that was just an observation. Is it really, is there more of this now than there was? Or has it just always been this way? I mean, is there really more ballot box biology and ballot box what, whatever? Wildlife management. Yeah, I think we go through waves, okay. to be honest with you. I think there are periods, you know, when I think back through my career, there were periods where we had ballot initiatives that we fought and that we supported. And then you'll have a quiet period for a while, and then it creeps back up again. So it's usually when there's an action and a reaction mm -hmm. that's out there. and. Oh, like I'll show you. That's right. I'll give you a bell box initiative. <laughs> but we have seen some of the national challenges towards uh -huh. hunting and fishing. We have seen those been direct campaigns that are now being fought at the state level. Mm -hmm. So I think you see more activity to try and restrict and also promote hunting mm -hmm. and fishing at that state level than we used to do, um, where it used to be. You know, we had more national legislation and the rest of it. And so there's more activism at that state level. Okay. So that is a thing. Yeah, I think so. Because you were saying earlier that big box, all the giant big box and no one after them might have been a bad, might be faulty memory. Might be faulty but memory. But the days back when they weren't ballot box initiating wildlife decisions is new-ish. Yeah, I you or, know or it's expanded. You know, I remember we had we had some back in the seventies, but then really in the nineties it really came alive and then we've kind of seen it dying down and now it's it's you know, we had periods across the country where there was a big push to to do ballot initiatives to protect the right to hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. Um and now you're seeing challenges again. Yep. So and we're seeing a big push right now and several states for trying to advocate for these commissions to have appointments that are non-hunters and yes. even anti-hunters and anglers. Yeah, zookeepers. Yeah. No, oh, we got a, uh, <laughs> everybody's got an interest in the state's wildlife. Yep. So we need to have those interests represented on the board. Uh, unfortunately like that never, you never get to ask the question, well, are their interests not being represented currently by our current management plan? We never get to ask that. So what what is the impetus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, they're managing far more species that aren't hunted and fished than are. And have been for quite some time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> let, let me give you one last question. Then, then these guys might have a last question. You're not going to do the, who are you voting for again, are you? Oh, yeah, who are you voting for? How do you handle that? I'm voting for my daughter. She's running for county commissioner. Again oh. this year. <laughs> See, there you are. Partisan yeah, yeah. politics. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nepotism. How, how do you handle that question? Let, 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 let's role play for a minute. I'm, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, uh, running for president. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and some, we're having a meeting about agenda. He says, Hey, I want to hear from the big conservation groups about what, what you guys are thinking and where I'm crafting my thing. And then we, we finished up the meeting and, and like you and I meet in the hallway and I'm like, well, can I plan on your support this November, Becky? Now you do your part. I just did my part. You know, <laughs> can I plan on your support this November? <laughs> If it's a candidate that I was already planning to support and I felt was the best candidate, I would probably let that individual know that I was going to support them personally, not well, as no, the organization. No, you got to do it in the role play way. Oh. <laughs> no, Steve. I want to do it first. You first, don't have I'm her not, vote. First, no, I'm not. I, don't, I don't have your vote. I don't have your vote, so no, do that. No. I'm still deciding, but at this point, I'm not leaning towards this. But, you know. That's I, what you'd say? It depends on, on the situation. You'd let them down easy. If I was... In representing TRCP at the meeting, yeah. I wouldn't answer it at all. But how, how, okay. <laughs> how do you answer it? That's why I'm trying to do the role play. Here we are, you're representing TRCP. And I say, I'd like to know that I could count on your support this November. I'm just like, how do you do it? I, I'm interim CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, which is a nonprofit. Legally, we cannot oh. support partisan candidates. Hard to argue that. entrapment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's good. I'm just helping you rehearse because this might happen to you. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> uh, here, here's the last one. The last one I got from you. Where should people? Um, where should be people be paying the most attention in the next four years? If we're talking about just conservation with a big C, right? Like not not local, not necessarily local issues. Like oh, they messed with our elk management plan, but like big picture your kids are going to feel the impacts of this where should people be paying attention well a couple things i think they really need to pay attention to number one is we talked about it earlier those working landscapes as this country moves into renewables and we have more and more pressure on the landscape livestock in close proximity to wildlife and the whole nine yards we need to make sure that we are planning for that and putting together good overall policy and policy direction that accommodates both both renewable energy, people, livestock, food, and wildlife, and great hunting access mm -hmm. out on the landscape and fishing. The other part of it is, I would say, on the accessibility issues to making sure that our public lands remain public and that the tools that we have in the toolbox for incentivizing private land management remain there and remain effective. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get a farm bill through. You guys know the last farm bill expired in September of 23, has one year extension. It's going to expire again in 24, later this year. And that is the biggest piece of conservation legislation usually that we ever pass. It's huge. 60% of this country is in private land. And you know, that farm bill provides tremendous incentives to, for people to farm the best and leave the rest. You know, it's kind of yeah, one of the yeah. catchphrases that we say out there, but really helps people steward that landscape. And wildlife, they don't recognize property boundaries. I mean, the bottom line is we need great public land management and we need great private land management. And I, I personally believe we need very good active management. We can't just draw a line around it, leave it alone, and call it good unless we're willing to wait centuries for, mm. you know, restoration after major wildfires or, you know, for big storms and, you know, the, do huge blowdowns and, and you can't even use that, that particular land for a while. Got it. All right. So. Thank you for sharing. Randy, you want to ask me? Are you going to vote for me? See, 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 see. <laughs> you can I count on your you support this on November? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell well, anyone. Well, you, you can. You know what? You wouldn't do it for me, but I'm going to tell you right now. You can count on my support. All right, all right. I hope that's <laughs> monetary <November>. support <laughs> this November. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Thanks for thanks for coming on, and thanks for all the work that you're doing. Oh, my pleasure. We've got a great team all. at TRCP, which you certainly know, and and all of you do. And um, 
they do great work and they and they tackle the big problems you know i think that's the thing that trcp i feel most strongly about a lot of organizations play offense or defense on laws and policies but trcp really builds this think tank model where they pull all the groups together and do the energy to try and build good policy direction and then build that campaign from the ground up that's pretty special and it takes lots of time and effort you well know, what, uh, oh, uh, sorry go ahead what do we gain by supporting a group like trcp because it's not a membership organization no it's not it's not a membership organization most of our funding about two-thirds of it comes through grants and foundations and then personal donors um, and family fam foundations that donate unrestricted revenue. But what you gain from it, I think, is the coalition, pulling the, com the organizations together um, around common ideas, big picture ideas, and then doing the legwork to really invest and figure out how we're going to solve those problems. Well, I appreciate uh, the life you've spent in conservation, and I appreciate... Um, your measured, rational, well-articulated perspectives on things. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, uh, that'll that'll this will inoculate us from some of the nonsense that we're going to hear between now, from all directions. Oh, it's between now. And it's already started. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. I know. It's it's going to be a tough year in that regard. <laughs> it really is going to be a tough year. Well, hang in there. Well, uh, maybe after the election, you can come back and then tell us what you think. No, I'm I'm hopeful after the election, I'm going to be retired. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're re-retired. Re re-retired. Re re-retired. I'm well, going to get it right this well, time. We'll, we'll pipe you in like uh, Susie Orman there from <laughs> your okay. Bahamas. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> from your 35-foot uh, yeah, boat. boat. That's right. From the Bahamas. All right. Thank you very much. Becky Humphreys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Well, I've been through a lot of heartbreaks, the pretty and the ugly, but I've seen a pattern here lately. They always tend to love me all throughout the fall, but when it comes to springtime, they start dropping. They only want me for my hunting They only want me for my fishing holes They only want me for the mallards and buffaloes They come around every fall They only want me for my hunting They only want me for the sand hill cranes They only want me for the white tail bucks And the green
but now I know they're gonna miss my land. They're gonna.